Hello and welcome to White Centipede Noise Podcast. I'm Oscar Brummel, and today my guest is Marcus Labonte of the Colorado-based label Cloister Recordings. If you're a fan of White Centipede Noise Podcast but not currently supporting it, please head over to patreon.com slash white centipede noise now and become a Patreon supporter. I rely on Patreon support from noise and industrial fanatics such as yourself to keep the show going, and in return you get access to bonus episodes, a private Discord server, mail order discounts, and much more. So head over to patreon.com slash white centipede noise now to find a level of support that fits you. Hello, Marcus. Thank you so much for meeting me on your day off to talk about Cloister Recordings. Um, you run this powerhouse label called Cloister Recordings in the U.S., focusing on a lot of industrial, dark ambient, death industrial, things like that, but a wider scope i mean a lot of stuff we're going to talk about that but um what what was it that got you motivated well okay one question i have actually beforehand do you do do you do music on your own um i don't uh i've used to be in a few bands back in the day but as i've got older and with my work life and the job that i work i pretty much have zero time to sit down and do anything musically or artistically creatively um it's something that i would like to pick back up again but like i said you know time is not my friend Mm -hmm. by any means yeah you know the time that i do have um pretty much just goes into cloister you know what i mean like order packing correspondence you know i sadly you know i have very little time to even listen to music, which is fucking awful. Um, I get most of my listening done, sadly, when I'm, you know, running around doing errands, driving around and stuff like that. You know, I try to listen to at least one physical piece a day, um, but sometimes, you know, that doesn't even get to happen. Like today I listen to that new Space Machine box that came out on Hiroshima. Mm-hmm. And I started it yesterday, and I finished it today, and that was pretty much, like, the only thing that I've really listened to in the past week. Sure. Uh, but, you know, hopefully, you know, things will change um, on the music front. You know, Nicole and I have a rig down in the basement, and... You know, she toys around with it more than I do, and she's better at it than I am, anyway. So, but uh, like a like a like a gear rig or like a synth kind of rig or, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, we got a little MS twenty mini and just you know mixer and a few pedals that we just kind of dick around on, you know. Huh. But yeah, I don't really foresee anything in the future, but who knows? Like maybe I'll get fired from my job and I'll be able to sit down and <laughs> do something. Okay, so so you started Cloister not as an artist, but as a as a fan. I, I yeah, as a who, collector, pretty as a, much. As a collector, what motivated you to start the the label in the first place, and how did that decision go about? 
Well, so it originally was started by a very close friend of mine back when I was living down in Arizona. His name was Justin Rodriguez, and mm. he was this uh, just nerdy power metal kid that used to come into the record store that I was working at down there. And, uh, you know, I'd get, give him recommendations on stuff and then, like, expand his musical horizons, and it got to the point where, like, he would come in at least once a week and have me pick out a bag for him. Um, and then he just went down the wormhole and, you know, started collecting black metal tapes, industrial tapes, things of the sort. And, uh, I got him a job working at the record store and it was really funny cause he was completely socially awkward, like worse than me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, he uh, basically was in contact with this black metal kid that was living down in Australia that went by the name of Dead Hills. And mm -hmm. it was just some bedroom BM stuff, you know, nothing awesome, but it was still good for a kid who I think he was probably like 17 or 18 at the time. Um, and yeah, Justin told me, he's like, dude, I'm starting this label and I'm going to put this kid's stuff out. You know, and I thought that that was like super cool. That was always something that, you know, I wanted to do when I was his age. You know, at mm -hmm. the time, Justin was 20. And uh, yeah, he was just super fucking stoked. Like, like the, the excitement that he had, you know, like he helped, I helped him like assemble the, you know, the first edition of the tapes and all this kind of stuff. And, it was just, you know, I was super, super stoked for him that he was like, you know, finding uh, his footing in just like, you know, experimental ambient industrial music and black metal mm -hmm. and all the things. Uh, and then him and two of our friends were out hiking one day and he is an avid outdoorsman. Um, it was early in the summer, but it was early in the day. And they went out hiking, and then he collapsed and passed on the side of a mountain. Damn. Um, which was fucking devastating. I knew he had an underlying heart condition because he had an episode at work one day where he had to go to the emergency room. Um, but he wasn't very vocal about it with his family. I don't want to get into it about his family, but sure. I'll just say that I'm not a fan. Um yeah. You know, and I told them to, you know, check in the autopsy for this heart condition and they refused to do it, blah, 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 blah. So they just ruled it as a, you know, heat related death. Um, but yeah, so that was totally devastating to me and my friends mm. who were close with him. And he had done this one release. You know what mm. I mean? And I was like, I just figured the best way to honor him would be to keep it going. And wow. we did that. And it's kind of morphed into what it is today, which is a little bit more than I can chew, I guess. <laughs> but I guess that's a good thing. I don't know. Wow. Okay. That's beautiful. I mean, that's beautiful. I didn't. I had no idea about that. That's, uh, yeah. Does yeah. that did did that kind of also decide the the direction of the label in terms? I mean, there's only one release, but are you are is do you keep his tastes in mind with the label? Uh, I mean, I definitely do. Like the first release back, you know, after he had passed was the. Sutek Hexen and Trepanering uh live gig from Stella Natura, and he was a huge Sutek fan. Like, he mm -hmm. loved them so much. And, you know, I'm good buddies with the old lineup. Like, I'm still in constant contact with all of those guys. And then, obviously, Thomas is one of my best friends and favorite artists of all time with mm -hmm. multiple of his projects. So we kind yeah. of just did this one thing and I just, you know, Justin wanted to release things that he liked, 
without caring if anybody else liked them or not. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what I've kept doing is releasing things that I like regardless of popularity or style or Mm -hmm. what have you. Like if I like it enough, I'll release it and I don't really care if anybody else does or not. So, and that's pretty much how I, I keep his memory. So. Awesome. Out now on absurd exposition, Zenta sustained serpent track patterns, 12 inch new 2022 material from the cult collaborative project between Ryan Bloomer and Sam McKinley forthcoming absurd exposition CDs from Dodge Jones, rage, Neural, Fold, and Rasalka, with many more releases planned for 2023 and beyond. Plus, over 2,000 items currently in stock at Scream and Ride Distro, a Montreal-based source for experimental electronics, harsh noise, etc., offering affordable shipping worldwide. Visit ScreamingRide.com for ultimate noise power. How would you describe what you like or what you choose to release on Cloister? I mean, I'm kind of all over the place. Uh, musically, like, I like metal love and death industrial is like my true love Mm -hmm. like i just i i find myself listening to that more often than most things Mm -hmm. um i love ambient and heavy electronics um yeah i mean there's not really one thing that i could say that, you know, I stick to this and I stay with that. You know, I like sure. having a wide range of styles on the label just because, like, that's how I am as a listener. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I am I could put out, you know, a nasty, you know, power electronics album and then put out, you know, a borderline techno tape. Like, yeah. it's just kind of all over the place. Yeah. Um, I don't really do much metal related stuff anymore just because most of it sucks nowadays. Um, (laughs) and I just have found myself fairly disinterested in a lot of like more modern stuff and the stuff that I do like, you know, um, there's, there's just, there's enough metal labels out that, that take care of that stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've just, I I like to keep it with what I like, basically. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like I've, I've noticed you on like message boards or that Facebook group noise now playing. And I've Mm -hmm. seen for at least a while, you often posting like tons of crazy, harsh, like pure harsh noise stuff. Mm -hmm. You don't release that much harsh noise on Cloister. Is that true? That is true, and it kind of goes back with the metal. Is like there's uh, there's enough noise labels, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? And you know a lot of the stuff that I listen to personally, like it's it's here or there, you know. Um, Yeah, I you know there's guys like you that can you know release the harsh harsh stuff, you know like. I'll listen to, I don't know. It, it, it really depends on the mood. And some days it's like, I just want to be fucking blasted and have my brain melted. And then yeah. other days I want to listen to fucking Enya, you know, but yeah, you know, like going back to, you know, that Facebook noise group, like I, I wish I could be more present on it. Um, but at the same time, like, I don't know. It, it just it, it it seems a little redundant to me. Like you know, a lot of people are posting the same album, and it's right. all like like new. It's it's basically like uh, what I'm getting from most of it. It's just like a platform for new releases. You know, right. like hey, we got this one, and you know, there's there's very few people that I see that are like posting like old stuff or whatever. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's the group's weird and I'm just like me and social media just aren't friends. Like I've, I've always, I've always hated 
you know, promoting <laughs> things, which is a, a bad, bad quality of mine because I just, I just hate the fucking internet. Um, uh, but it's, it, it's one thing that I have to, you know, succumb to, yeah. is, you know, um, but yeah, that, it seems like that, you do pretty well with it. I mean, I, I, I feel like I'm oftentimes either writing you about an upcoming batch or seeing a batch that comes out, and I'm mm-hmm. like, it's stuff that's not necessarily as in my wheelhouse. Like I don't know about it, but then I'll like look at it and be like, holy shit, this is a bunch of like crazy legendary artists that you're releasing like ten releases right now, mm-hmm. and it's like pretty. I mean. It seems, I mean, it sells really well for me and it seems like it goes up, but you're very low key about it. Like you're very low key about your promotion and, and it doesn't get a lot of like attention beforehand, but like, you'll just like drop a bunch of like really crazy stuff and also like stuff mixed in there. Like you said, like, like kind of obscurities that I feel like aren't so known, but it's just like, you, I feel like this is what you are into. And what do you get out of releasing someone else's work that isn't so known. I really, I like the satisfaction that they receive, you know what I mean? Like, you know, and I also really like releasing stuff of unknowns, you know what I mean? Guys or women that I feel that deserve, you know, more notoriety and, you know, a wider listening base. Um, and those are, I don't really call it risks, but they are definitely like gambles that I take with releasing stuff because if it is unknown, you know, there, there's people out there that when they're ordering stuff, you know, they, they're buying things that they know what it is, you know what I mean? But I also do have, um, regular customers that just kind of buy whatever I put out, which is awesome because they're taking that risk of, Mm -hmm. you know, like what if this is absolutely fucking terrible Mm -hmm. or, you know, it's not up their alley. Um, but you know, it's just, that's kind of how I, I go about it with, with new artists. And usually like, you know, I very, very, very seldom take on submissions of, people I don't know or haven't been in communication with. Um, and yeah, like, like prime example, the last unsolicited submission that I received was that DBMZ cassette that I released mm-hmm. in, it was maybe like five, five months ago or so. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd been familiar with, I, I recognized the name of the person on the email and I, you know, looked up, you know, to see like what they've been involved in and whatnot. And I listened to it and I was actually like, this is fucking incredible. Yes, mm-hmm. I will release this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because of that, that develops a new relationship with somebody else and, you know, that project is a duo of two guys. And now I'm going to be doing a tape of, from one of the guys solo efforts, Mm -hmm. which I was unfamiliar with at the time. And, you know, he sent me a bunch of CDs and listening to it. And I was just like, yes, this is, this is something that I like, but you know, I, I get a lot of submissions on a weekly basis and it's always from people that have no clue what the label is about Mm -hmm. you know what i mean and it's like i don't it's like they're just fishing and i i understand that every label gets that you know what i mean but it's it's just it's it's kind of like do your fucking homework before you email you know and if it's something that you know i'm familiar with you know, I'll entertain the idea, but I'm so behind on releases that, you know, if I do get a submission from somebody, I'm like, you know, this is a possibility, but it's not going to happen for a couple of years. So if you want to look for another label, please do just because it's like, you know, with, with the vinyl plant backups, um, I'm not really big into CD releases Mm -hmm. just because I, 
don't have the room <laughs> to to have tons and tons of stuff. Yeah. But I do need to pr- to really strongly consider like doing more CD releases mm-hmm. because the vinyl plants are so backed up and the costs have increased you know 15 20% over the past few years every right. year. Yeah. So um CDs are also quite fitting for I think the type of music you do really. And and that is also true. It it, it really is. I just, you know, I like doing things in smaller editions. Yeah. You know, and it's like with CDs, like if I'm going to do a CD, I might as well do a few hundred of them. Right. Like with Sam's newest album, I did 300 of those, you know, and they came out phenomenal. Yeah. Like Kevin Yoon from Sutek and in Solus Publishing did the layout for it. And, you know, we kind of went all out and got like the spot UV varnish. So it's yeah. just like, it, it's a beautiful, beautiful CD. Nice. It sounds yeah, I can't wait to get those. Yeah, you'll get them soon. (laughs) Sweet. Available now on Virtues, Kate Rissek, Decayed Signals LP. Kate Rissek has been cultivating her sound with strict focus, making her project Rasulka a veritable household name. For her new LP on Virtues entitled Decayed Signals, she sheds the Rasulka moniker, starting fresh, yet sacrificing none of the project's intensity and strength. Also available, John Miller, The Future is Unlimited Always, Digibook CD, Mott, Fickle CD, Releases from Corporate Park, Doll, Swollen Organs, Fog of Joy, Climax Denial, and more. This and other quality post-industrial music can be discovered at virtueslabel.com. Regarding people like soliciting your label, what would you tell people is a good way to approach a label in general or develop a working relationship with a label? Uh, I mean, if it's if it's a if it's a submission from an artist that has obviously not looked into what I do, I just don't even respond and I just delete them. Like, sure. I I don't know. I'm just, I, I'm, I guess you could say kind of an asshole about it, but I think, no, not I mean, that's very fair. I'm just, but I'm just thinking for, for someone listening, who's like, you know, thinking, Oh, I mean, you know, I'm working on some stuff, but I want to, how do I, how should I approach a label? Oh, what would you say? I mean, you know, like, how should I go about that? Yeah, fluidity is a great thing, you know, like, you know, hey, you know, I've looked into your label and I do this type of music, you know, can you listen to it and give me some, you know, feedback? Like, let me know if, you know, not, not if it's something that you could release, but like, do you think like, I'm on the right track or do you think this is better? And like, that's hard for me to tell somebody because I'm not a musician. I'm Mm -hmm. a listener and a collector. So it's really hard for me to be like, you know, you should do this and do that and blah, 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 blah. Um, But like, you know, if, 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 you know, I get like a super generic submission, I just be like, keep practicing, keep, you know, find your niche or find, you know, what, like, take your influences and really try to hone them in with your own signature type of deal. Because, you know, like, we have, you know, hundreds of the same album. You right. know what I mean? So, what, like, what I like is if it's something that's different mm-hmm. from the norm, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, but you know, like there are things that I'll listen to. Like I just got a submission from a Japanese guy that I did a little research on and it looks like he, you know, has done his due diligence with past releases and stuff. So like, I'll give it a listen, but he, he asked like, you know, please give me feedback. Like, let me know if, you know, this is good or whatever. Um, and that's, you know, that's when I'll take time to actually look and, like, listen to a submission. But, you know, there's also people that <laughs> it's really funny. And it's usually metal guys. But, you know, I'll get, you know, we have this album ready for vinyl and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I'm just like, first of all, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Second, like, who are you? <laughs> like... You know, and I, I get a lot of that, you know, people mm-hmm. that are wanting their albums released on 
highly expensive formats and yeah. high numbers and you know they've done like a demo tape you yeah. know so but you know like i said it's it's usually like metal dudes that are that are trying to you know it, it demand vinyl and all that kind of stuff it's pretty funny yeah it's funny um You've done with your label what I think is pretty cool, and I don't see it a lot in the scene, at least in like the noise and industrial scene. You see maybe more in the metal scene. Like you've done split format releases quite a mm-hmm. bit, oftentimes with other labels, or you'll even do it under your own label, like like a, an LP and a CD version of something, mm-hmm. or, or like well, like well, like CD with the with the crawl of time. But a lot of times, like an LP and a tape version, or sometimes you'll mm-hmm. combine it with like a, another label, like you know. Mm-hmm. You know like Cold Spring, I think with with um, with Malignant, they'll do the the CD or the LP version. You'll do yeah. you know a different format. How yeah. does that work out? I mean, usually it's you know it kind of goes back to the you know things that I really like or you know friends that you know like prime example with you know the Malignant stuff. Me and Jason have had a, you know, he's he has been one of the guys that's given me a lot of pointers over the years. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I'm a huge fan of Malignant. Like, yeah. the dude has put out incredible stuff over the years. And, you know, he's one of those labels that he's he was putting out stuff that he liked regardless if other people were going to like it or not. You know, yeah. and I really, really respect him in that fashion and you know he gave me a lot of pointers and basically you know like when i was first getting going um he was like you know like i'm getting ready to do a cd of this or i'm gonna do an lp of this like do you want to you know maybe do a tape version you know and then Mm -hmm. it kind of has just you know like i am the type of collector which it's it's a bad quality but you know there's a lot of things that I have on all three formats, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And, you know, cause I have a CD player in the basement where the shop is mm-hmm. and, you know, I'll take a stack of CDs down when I'm packing orders, you know, and then my record player and my tape deck are upstairs, you know, right behind me. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, anything that I'm doing on this level of the apartment, you know, I'm listening on that, mm-hmm. uh, and I don't know, it's just like if I, I, I think that, you know, certain things need to have all three formats because there's three types of collectors. There's vinyl guys, the, there's CD collectors, and then there's tape collectors. Mm-hmm. And like I'm my preferred format is it was pretty much always been vinyl, but mm-hmm. with tapes as a close second, like mm-hmm. If you were to see the room that I'm sitting in right now, you would be like, fuck, man, you got a problem, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Um, So going back to that, you know, there's there's certain things that like, okay, so Cold Spring did the CD and the LP of the Dekaterska Forbund stuff. And that's, you know, that's Nordvarger and... Tree Pennering Switcher Allen's, you know, collab project, and mm-hmm. that shit's incredible, mm-hmm. you know, so I hit Justin from Cold Spring and, like, you know, hey, you know, Thomas wants a tape version of this, and so I just send Cold Spring some copies, and then they get the other formats from them, and, you know, mm-hmm. same goes for, you know, a bunch of different labels, and, you know, it, it just kind of, you know, I'm usually doing, like, the cheaper, the the cheaper version of the release, so to speak, you know, but like, I love tapes like Cloyster started out as a tape label and it will continue to be a primarily tape label just because, you know, a, they're quickest, they're cheap. Well, I wouldn't say that they're cheap anymore, but they're, you know, reasonable. Um, to do professionally and sometimes I'll do, you know, homemade releases at home. I'll just print Mm -hmm. off whatever on the printer and cut it up. And I got a really good old Sony stereo, you know, three to one duplicator Mm -hmm. that I'll just do quick runs off of, you Mm -hmm. know, depending on what it is. Um, 
but I just, I just, I, I love tapes. You know, if I was made of money, I would put out records all day long, but that is right. not the case right. at all. Yeah. And tapes are more flexible with the edition size as well. I mean, exactly. Exactly. You know, sometimes like I usually keep it at a hundred, but for certain releases, like I'll do 150, sometimes I'll do 200, you know, it, yeah. just, it all depends. Like, you know, the brighter does now tapes that I did a few years back. Like I did those in high editions right. mainly because, you know, I would sell, you know, a certain amount in the United States. And then the rest of them went to Roger for BDN tours and his, right. you know, band camp and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. it's just like, it varies from artist to artist, but usually the tape editions are always going to be in 100 yeah. unless it's like something like for the last dominion of flesh, all the tapes that I did for that was 50 copies and that was it. Yeah. So, um, I want to ask you about Dominion of Flesh soon, but a little bit back to your curation style and like what you also said about um, Malignant. Why is it important for labels to follow their own personal tastes and take these kinds of risks versus another model of kind of following what's what's popular? What's What does that do for the scene? I mean... The, I guess it, it basically just goes back to like integrity. You know what I mean? Like, there's always going to be people that do it for them and do it for their supporters and for their artists. And then there's going to be, you know, total fucking capitalists that are trying to just make a buck off of something that is popular, you know, this month or whatever. And, you know, that's fine. Like, if that's how other people want to run their labels, that's totally fine. But, like, within what what we are all involved in, no matter what, you know, um, genre is at the forefront of whoever's label, like, I recognize that, you know, in the industrial and power electronics and noise scene, like, all of the labels that I've been in contact with are not the types of people that are releasing stuff to make a buck. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, um, everybody that I've dealt with has stuck to their specific curations and they do it well. And I know they do it to their liking. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, you look at, Tesco, they've been putting out the same stuff for, you know, close to, what, what are we at, 40 years now? And it's still incredible, just like yeah. it was back then, yeah. you know? Um, and, you know, cold meat industry and Tesco are basically, like, my biggest influences, you know, for... Sure. for larger labels, yeah. you know, but like, you know, with collecting and stuff like that, you know, for the past, I don't know how many years I've been piecing together the slaughter collection slowly nice. and, you know, less than zero. And just like, I, I, I go backwards, you know, trying sure. to find the relics, you know, yeah. and, you know, sometimes that is, Beneficial is not the correct word, but like, you know, I'll be sitting listening to something that's old, 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 and, you know, it's a very like one off project. And then I'll get a wild hair and I'll just email the person and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll solicit it. I'll solicit people. Yeah. Um, you know, and I always go into a solicitation expecting a no, you know, but yeah. sometimes I'll get some old guard who's like, yeah, I'll do something like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to start working on my next batch of stuff after the new year. Um, but I got, uh, Federico de Caroli from Deca and Argyope, uh, to write a new Argyope record. And it's the first one in 25 years wow. that he's done. And like, you know, he did a few tapes on allegorical and a few tapes on slaughter 
And, you know, I just kind of like, hey, you know, I'm a big fan of all your stuff. And, you know, <laughs> I'd like to reissue some of this stuff maybe or if you have any new material. And then he basically was like, you know, I've been thinking about doing a new Argyo, but I didn't think anybody would care. So I never yeah. did until now. And then he just, you know, sent me four tracks of just this incredible, gross, you know, Italian death industrial. So, like, I'm way stoked on, you know, that. And it's like, you know, I like bringing, because reissues are an awesome, awesome thing that has been happening, Mm -hmm. Um, especially since, I, I mean, the past five years, there's been so much shit reissued that has been long deserved. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, I think it's really, really fucking cool that, you know, I can, sometimes I can get these guys out of the woodwork to write a new one. You That's know what super I mean? cool. Um, yeah, and I do like reissuing some stuff. I've even been thinking about starting a sub label that is just reissues, but you know that's something to think about in the future. You know, like I said, I'm about two years behind on releases, so I need to get caught up. And you know, D- does reaching out to someone? I mean, did that ever take? you some time to learn that reaching out to someone is possible like that kind of fear or or i guess reservedness about reaching out to someone who's maybe a, you know considered a legend or considered a someone mm-hmm. who, you know you kind of see someone as above you or something like that mm-hmm. and kind of taking that step to reaching out to them and like realizing oh like oftentimes this person's very open to hearing from me and maybe just like Oh, no one has asked me to do that before. Sure, I'll do that. Yeah. I mean, I always I go into it you know as going back to the, you know, the demo submissions. Um the worst possible outcome is a no. Right. You know what I mean? And that's totally fine. I've gotten people that like, you know, I've been like, "Hey, you know, this album really deserves a reissue." And some people are like, no, I don't want anything reissued. You know, I want it to be for diehards. And, you know, Mm -hmm. if you find it, you find it. If you don't, you don't. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, that just kind of makes the thrill of the hunt for, you know, said release or releases. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, like, all the S-Core shit is never going to be reissued. Mm -hmm. And that's, like, some of my favorite stuff. You know what I mean? So it's like... You know, th- there's, you know, something I, I, I rewarding, I guess you could say, when you find a copy of something that you've been looking for for 15 fucking years. Yeah. And, you know, then you, the price tag on it is, you know, $100 cheaper than you were expecting it to be. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like there's stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but you know, like I, I, I don't really. It's very few and far between that I do reach out to people that I've never spoken to in my entire life. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like there, you know, I travel a lot to to go to gigs and stuff like that because where I live in Denver, there is no fucking scene here for any of this shit. Like Mm -hmm. there is a very young noise scene that's starting to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but it's nothing that I'm really interested in. Um, Mm -hmm. there's a few artists from here that are on cloister that are close friends of mine. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, Denver is more of, you know, bad death metal Mm -hmm. and stoner rock and shitty Americana, you know, alt country stuff. Mm -hmm. Like it's a beautiful city, but the, the music scene as a whole is just nothing that, you know, I, I'm interested in. I tried doing gigs here and there was little, uh, interest 
Mm. A, prob- mostly because it's, you know, fairly unknown stuff or, you know, it's just like, you know, it. it's more of a social city than an actual, like, yeah. artistic, at least in what we're involved in. You know yeah, I, mean? I understand. Um, you know, there's a kid that lives down in Colorado Springs who did this... Um, front range noise fest which was cool yeah you know what i mean i wasn't able to go to it because i work weekends and i can't really give up my shifts to go to something like that but like that's the first thing that denver has had in regards to this underground that we're all involved in Mm -hmm. and i thought that it was super fucking cool yeah. He was doing that, and he had some really good artists on it. Like, he had Bohr come out for it, and Compactor, right. and a lot of good locals. Um, you know, Brandon and Preston, both the guys from Trust Collective and Tolerant. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, like, that's cool, because that has potential for the next one. You know what I mean? And people have been asking, like, why don't you do something in Denver? Why don't you do a Dominion of Flesh there? And it's like, the city's expensive, you know. It's it, it's a hard destination to come through, because it's you, if you don't live in the area, you have to fly in. Like, we're pretty right. landlocked at where we're at. Yeah. So it's it's difficult to invest the amount of money that it would cost to do that because you know I like to pay for artist travel right and or at least help with travel and right. you know actually pay them at the end of the, the gigs Right, um, and that's usually out of pocket because it's due to attendance. You know what right. I mean? Right. Um, but, you know, Dominion of Flesh, Sweden, the first one we did was not sold out by any means, but it was one of the best shows I've seen in my life, yeah. you know. And then the one that we just did in New York, you know, that was kind of thrown together over the course of a couple of months. Like, we yeah. weren't even planning on doing it. And Andrew from Fringe was like, hey, you know, I'm going to do this show um, you know, do you want to come out and help with it? And I was like, why don't we just turn it into a fucking rager and go ape shit? Yeah. And we did. And it was yeah. a shithole bar in Brooklyn and it was fucking awesome. Like it yeah. was just like every act was incredible yeah. and we had a great, great time. But again, you know, the, the gig didn't sell out, but it was awesome sure. because what I like about that is after the gig's over, you know, everybody is making their posts on social medias and what have you saying, you fucking people missed out, you kind yeah. of deal. And yeah. that's that's kind of like, I like that more than yeah. having a sold out gig. You know <laughs> what I mean? I like having the people that were there lose their minds and just like go ape shit. Like, I yeah. love it. For sure, that's amazing. Um, so, tell tell me what exactly is Dominion of Flesh like in the concept, and for people who don't know anything about it. Um, I mean, I'm I, I'm not I don't consider myself like a promoter by any means, but basically, it's like these shows that I put on are bands that I want to see. That you know, it's it most of them being European acts, or if they are American acts, they're all over the country Mm -hmm. and they're not anywhere close to where I'm at. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I kind of just want to throw together, you know, eight to 10 bands that I fucking love that I want to see. And if you want to come out and watch it with us, please do. Um, There's no real like specific, like, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? I'm having one of those brain farts I was telling you about earlier. Right. Um, there's no specific criteria as to who plays. Sure. You know what I mean? It's just like, all right, so if we're going to have the show in New York, we'll get half the bands from the East Coast in that area, and then we'll bring some other ones out from you know the Midwest or the Central or, or West Coast you know, to get 
you know, more uh, diversity. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, And I also like doing uh, gigs where it's like everybody that plays is like a headliner type act. You know what I mean? Like everybody that plays, you know, is just as good as the next one that's playing, no matter if they're a veteran or if they're a rookie, you know what I mean? Like it's, it, it's stuff that I really, really, really love that I want other people to see yeah. all in one go. You know what I mean? Um, and that's kind of how I go about it by, by that. Um, but it, 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 it varies. Like, like I'm, I kind of wanted it to be like, I'll do one every year kind of deal. Like, you know, five year, six year, eight year, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But mm-hmm. obviously with COVID that kind of fucked everything up. Um, sure. Which was fine. Um, so I'm not really planning the next one until 2024. Okay. And that's, most likely going to be a destination location in Sweden. So I don't want to divulge too much about it right now, but it's going to be held in a location that's fucking incredible. But people will have to travel for it. Like, you know, fly into Stockholm and get on a bus or a train and go to somewhere in the middle of fucking nowhere Awesome. You know, to to go to this gig, you know, yeah. so it's going to be like more of a, a a visual experience that will complement everything that's going on inside. And like I said, like we'll make some more announcements later on down the line, but it's definitely the first thing of this level of location that I've ever done. But I think that once people figure out what it is, I think people will come out for it. And, you know, if they do, they do. And if they don't, whatever, like, it'll be be sick for you and the people who are there. Yeah. So that's killer. That's exciting. We'll we'll see how it pans out for sure. And, you know, you know, I'm going to, I'm not going to start reaching out, to the artists that I have in mind for it, but it'll definitely be something that will be truly, truly magical regardless of who plays. Sick. So there's a lot of things involved in convincing artists and people to come to the show because you you got to be in some sort of physical shape like decent okay. physical shape. Uh, there's uh, obstacles and all sorts of things that need to be uh, overcome before you can get into the, into the griminess of all of it. So, all right. Awesome. Well, I look forward to hearing that announcement. How, how many dominions of dominion of fleshes have you done so far? I've done two. Okay. And, um, the first one was in 2019 in Sweden in November. And, uh, the last one was obviously this New York one, but I've done a few shows in Oakland and a couple of small, small gigs in Denver, like under different names. But I, I like to, I don't know why I do this, but I like to have like, a title for the gig more than just like these, you know, four acts yeah. of playing and, you know, like, I don't know. It's just, I like having a theme. Cause you were behind a recent people. gig in Oakland, right? Like a, like a year or two back. Wasn't it? That was sort of like a festival type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So there was, it was like, um, I called it some kind of nothing and it was basically like more Oakland, California, like Northern California acts. Yeah. Um, that was more, you know, folk and ambient type stuff. And it ended up kind of being, I mean, we had a blast, but it was also kind of a, a disaster in the fact of like, there was, 
artist beef between other artists and, you know, okay. artists dating other artists and breaking up. So it was all fucking okay. weird and it all unfolded when we had gotten there. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was actually pretty, pretty hilarious. And the show was good. You know, it was, it was really good. And there was a well turnout. Um, uh, and then, you know, I've done a few gigs here in Denver, um, and I've even probably like five years ago or so, four or five years ago, I was doing like a, a monthly DJ night at this bar that was right across the street from my old house. So it was super easy to lug records over there. And I only mm -hmm. did vinyl and I even fucking did tapes one night. Cool. Um, but the bar that it was at was this like super hip, like craft cocktail bar and the drinks were so freaking expensive like i didn't charge anybody to come in yeah. but like i kept telling this bar i'm like look i know you guys are a craft bar but go buy like some like 30 racks of cheap fucking beer so we yeah. can get people in the door yeah you know what I mean? And you guys would make some more money. And they yeah. were just like, well, we're not all about that, blah, 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 blah. Uh -huh. And I was like, well, I don't even drink, so I don't fucking care about your craft, you know, overpriced whatevers. And yeah. I basically just quit doing that. Okay. Um, and, you know, and of course, that location closed down within a few months because of, the, you know, yeah the the drinks were just too freaking expensive like yeah i work at a strip club drinks are expensive at a strip club because you're paying for the environment that you're right. in but if you're at some hole in the wall that can fit 30 or 40 people and you're charging 20 dollars for a shot with one ounce of booze in it like fuck off like <laughs> that's jesus no good i've been out of that loop for a while that sounds uh I didn't know it's like that. Yeah. Like, Denver's a fairly expensive city to go hang out in. Yeah. So, so that wasn't the place, because I, I, I think we established that we met or at least saw each other years before we were in contact through our labels, because I was on tour with a band. Burning. Burning. Yeah, and playing I with Echo, Echo Beds, yeah. who are from Denver, really cool industrial yeah. band from Denver. Oh yeah, I, I, Tom and Keith, I fucking love both of those guys. Yeah, too. they're great guys. I love those guys too. I haven't heard, I haven't been in touch with them in quite a while. But you were DJing that night, weren't you? Or, or were yeah, you just Keith, there? Yeah, Keith asked me. He's just like, hey, just come spend some records in this thing. And I think you actually walked up to me and asked me what I was playing. I think it was you. Could be. Yeah. Um, because I was on that weird, I, I I hate being on a stage. Yeah, so you're on a little it's, stage, yeah. Yeah, and I and like I was high up, and I don't remember if it was you, or there was another guy that was in the band that had long dreads that was playing percussion. Yeah, and I remember Brandon. I was playing. Yeah, I was playing a Marie Davidson album, and somebody came up. Just I was playing a track off of one of her records, and somebody came up and was like, "Shoot, this is fucking amazing! What is this?" And yeah, I mean that show was cool, even though nobody was there. Yeah, it was still an awesome show. Like when you guys yeah. were like, "Fuck the stage, we're gonna play on the floor." I was like, "Hell yeah, this this is what I like. I like yeah. being, you know, right in front, basically to just feel that energy." I think, you know, for for this type of stuff, you know, floor is the best for sure, in my opinion. Um, I just floor is you know, good unless you can really bring, unless you can really bring the energy from afar. But a yeah. lot of people don't. A lot of people can't really. They can't really master the stage. Yeah, unless you're a veteran that have been doing it for so long that it's yeah, exactly. just like yeah. So, what's it like, uh, like logistics? wise organizing a show in sweden for example because it seems like that's a lot of work and a lot of sac i mean it must be hard too I mean, sweden's not cheap also no it is not um it's usually a financial disaster but the logistics side of all of it is like you know for the first dominion of flesh that we did half the guys were from sweden already 
So mm-hmm. it's easier for them to travel mm-hmm. by train or car. Yeah. And then, you know, we had people from Spain and Germany. So it's basically, it's like what the idea behind them is whatever the region is, I'm trying to get a good chunk of artists from that region, whether it be, you know, you know, Scandinavia into, you know, Germanic area. Um, and with the United States, you know, like with this last one, like most of the acts were from the East coast. It wasn't Mm -hmm. that hard for them to travel. And each one that I do, I like to keep it like that just a, to keep costs down because I'm always out of pocket. It doesn't matter. Every, yeah. Not every penny is out of pocket, but a lot of it is out of pocket. You know, yeah. like Sweden is – Sweden gigs are interesting because you basically don't get paid after the show. You have to invoice and all this other kind of weird shit that it's like I'm used to being like, all right, cool. We made this much money. Here's your cut. Here's your cut. Here's mm-hmm. your cut. And what I do for gigs like that, because I want to pay my artists for showing up and playing. So I have X amount of dollars set aside, and then I pay them, and then I worry about getting paid back later kind of deal. And that way, everybody's happy, and they want to do more gigs. So this next one that we're going to plan will have you know, artists of higher caliber um, because of working with me previously and, you know, actually, you know, getting financially appreciated for, for doing the work instead of just, you know, Hey, come play this fest. You might get like 10 bucks. You know what I mean? Like I'm not really. How important is that? What do you mean? Like, like how, like like making sure people are taken care of and 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 taking maybe even if it means, even if it means taking a loss for yourself. I mean that, but that's a sacrifice that you know. At the end of the day, I'm I'm cognitively making that decision that I'm definitely yeah. going to lose money on it. But it's 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 experience based, like. You know, if I lose four grand, but I had one of the best times in my life, like it's, it, you, yeah. know, you know, at the, you know, I don't know. I don't want to say at the end of the day, money is shit because at the, you know, at the end of the day, when it comes that, you know, releases need to be getting done and artists yeah. need to be paid. Like, yes, that is a very important aspect of everything. But at the same time, it's like. I used to spend all of my money, you know, snorting fucking cocaine and drinking like crazy. And it's like, at least this way, I'm using that money for something more constructive and on a positive experience versus, you know, being a total fucking piece of shit waste oil. Yeah. So. Um, You mentioned that you work a lot and that time is very limiting limited for you how mm-hmm. do you manage that like i mean you have a really intense work schedule you usually when i talk to you you're at work and you seem like you're just going constantly yeah and you're doing crazy stuff with the cloister and all your your shows and your festivals all the time how do you how do you make that work i mean so the reason that i work the job that i work because i'm an independent contractor so i write my own schedules mm-hmm. so while i'm home i work like fucking crazy because it's all, you know, cash based and that's how I'm able to, you know, really fund releases or these gigs. Um, you know, everything was going fine until COVID hit and I haven't really recovered from Mm -hmm. COVID, um, mainly because of my incident that I had back in August of 2020, and dealing with the hospital bills from all of that. And, you know, there was just like a really bad, like, th- my physical well being f- that followed that was not good and is still not good. Um, 
and there was a lot of money that we spent on hospital bills and, yeah. you know, just getting out of all of that to where, like, I basically had to dip into the label to pay yeah. the fucking hospital, like, which yeah. sucks, but, you know, that's USA Healthcare. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, so, w- so what happened there? Because I know for a while there was re- it was really touch and go, and we were really concerned. Something really serious happened. I mean, I mean, how so, are you? And how are you now? I mean, if you might, if you if you don't mind, kind of explaining what happened there a bit. Well, basically, what happened was um, I was asleep, and you know, Nicole is a very very light sleeper. And she, like, felt a little commotion and looked over, and she said that it looked like I was just kind of reaching over to the bedside table to maybe grab my phone or a glass of water or something, and then I just fell off the bed. And I was totally unresponsive. I had no pulse. I wasn't breathing. Um, And so she's, you know, on the phone with 911 and trying to do CPR and all this shit. And finally the ambulance gets there and I'm fucking like dead. Like I'm dead. And they hit me with the the fucking defib pads a few times and got a pulse. And then they rushed me to the hospital and I was in a coma for a few days and they didn't know if I was going to make it out of the coma or what. So my, Fuck, my folks flew up here, and it was just, I guess it was this thing, and they didn't have an answer, you know, they they thought that it was a drug overdose, like, you know, white guy, mid to late 30s, heart attack, or sudden cardiac arrest, I should say, usually means one thing, drug overdose, because, duh, but I haven't done hard drugs at this point and let's see that was 2020 like 11 years at that point Mm -hmm. no alcohol no drugs you know but long story short like i woke up from this coma and i was all pissed off because they had all this shit all over my head and they shaved a huge chunk out of my beard and i had no Mm -hmm. idea where i was and like it was just like crazy And they basically like, well, we thought that it was this and it wasn't that. And we think it's this. So we did tests for that. And it's not that. Like they thought it was sleep apnea or some sort of genetic thing. And we basically have done every single test with no answer. Still. Still no answer. Like, and, you know, my, I, my cardiologist had left without really giving any fair warning. So I had a meeting. The last meeting that I had with the cardiologist was this new guy, and he was just looking at my chart and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I just want an answer, like an idea, like anything. Like, we've ruled out this. We've ruled out all of this stuff. And his response to me was, sometimes people just drop dead and i was like that's fucking bullshit you guys don't care because i'm on medicaid and all of this other stuff so it's they just push you through the system just to like get you out and do whatever but they ended up putting a defibrillator like inside of me so i got this fucking zapper in me that you know as a fail safe just in case my heart stops again and but the brain damage from it has been like the thing that I've been dealing with since then with longevity. Really? It's like my short term memory is fucking just toast. It's gone. Oh, damn. Um, it could be way worse. You know what yeah. I mean? It could yeah. it could have been way worse for being in the coma. I could have woken up a fucking vegetable. Like yeah. there could have been a million different outcomes to all of this. And, you know, the short-term memory loss is, like, the worst outcome of it other than, like, uh, you know, depression and bipolar anxiety, all that kind of shit um, that I had beforehand. But I was Mm. spending so much time trying to recover my memory that I totally, like, had 
all the previous mental shit on the back burner, mm-hmm. and that came out full force, and that's kind of the reason that Cloyster has been as sporadic as it's been since that event. You know, like, I go through bouts of not giving a shit at all, and which is bad, but um, it just, you know, it, it it's one of the most difficult things that I've had to navigate, like, having... Um, issues with speaking, basically. Like I'm, I'm used sure. to my, I'm used to having an elephant's memory, mm-hmm. and you know, I could be mid conversation with somebody about a specific topic, and then my brain will just like shut off. Mm-hmm. And one of my doctors kind of described it as, you know, the 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 claw machine at the arcade where you're going down to grab the teddy bear or whatever and it's like the cl- the claws going down and it's grabbing that memory and it's pulling it up and as soon as you get it just falls you know what i mean like that's yeah. uh, that's the hardest thing um that i've been dealing with and it definitely has affected me um you know directly and indirectly just in certain situations you know what i mean and it's nothing that i really like talking about to people um but in regards to cloister it's like that's where the sporadicness is coming from is well dealing with all of that dude you're a resilient motherfucker because first of all you've been talking throughout this whole thing super clearly it would never have caught that at all and second of all you work your ass off with Cloister. You released okay. That I remember that happened, uh, like okay, twenty twenty it was I guess. But you've released more things on Cloister since then than most labels do in their lifetime. I mean, you've you've stayed you've you've organized fest shows and festivals. I mean, you're very very active. I would just say you know don't stress that because it doesn't look like Cloister is sporadic or or like uh (laughs) slowing down in any way yeah and you know that's a huge thing to go through and i think not to put too much pressure or expectation on yourself i mean i know you love doing it i hope you love doing it but i mean like yeah i mean there's days that i've wanted to give up numerous 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 times especially in the past few years but you know nicole will not let me quit like every time I talk about it, she just shoots me a look and I know what it means, <laughs> you know, and <clears throat> because it's like, if I didn't do this, I don't know what I would do to keep myself busy or happy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I kind of, this is like running the label has basically been my therapy, even though it's counter and counter to like, you know, it's like, it's my therapy, but it brings on so much more stress, <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's good yeah. stress, you know what I yeah. mean? Um, and, like, I've been trying to get, you know, into, like, a quarterly release schedule, but it's difficult to do that, you know, with with the vinyl plant backups. Yeah. And just, like, you know, they are slowing down a little bit, which is good, but still it's like queuing up and trying to do like a small batch every three months is difficult. Like the last big, big batch that I did was, you know, right at the beginning of 2021, like I had been working on all of those tapes for like four or five months and just sitting on them as Mm -hmm. they came in while I was waiting for that control record to, to show up from the plant. That thing was at the plant for 14 months. Whoa. That's fucking ridiculous. Like, it's insane. And, you know, the reason that I went with that plant for that control record is because literally two months before that, I did the Cryptophagia album. And that thing was done from submission to test press to final product in two months. What? Like, it was, yeah, it was totally, I was like, well, fuck yeah, if this is how it's going to be. I'm going to use this plant. So I submitted two more records to them 
and it took them 13 months for control and almost 14 months for the agonal lust record. Like, wow. yeah, it was, so I'm just like, I need to You're reevaluate right. who I'm using. Um, I got to take a swig real quick. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so like the last few LPs that I've done, I've gone through, um, solid merch, which is basically just a broker through GZ. Right. Um, but what they do is they offer this express package where you omit the test press. So it, it better have a good master. Um, and I've done, let's see, one, two, Records. I did Vomit Arsonist, Mm -hmm. and I talked to Andy beforehand, and I was like, hey, so I found this place. They don't do test presses. Do you want to risk it? And he said, fuck it. Let's do it. So we did it, and it showed up, and it visually, for a bare bones package, you know, single pocket, double-sided insert, it sounds incredible and yeah. it looks fine. So we did yeah. the crawl of time record with it and it mm-hmm. was the same scenario. Like mm-hmm. sounds great. Looks great. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I use, I'm going to use them again soon for some upcoming stuff. Cool. Um, but it's a little, it's a little on the expensive side. So sure. you're spending a little bit more money, but you're also getting it in seven to 12 weeks. Okay, that's you know what I mean. That's nice. I and just, fast. Exactly, like you know, but that is a risk because you know something could happen, right? And there's no refund on it. So, right. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And then uh, Luve from friend from Sweden from Oku, he uh, recently uh, showed me a label. That, or a, a plant in France that he's been using. So I'm mm-hmm. on their site right now and they offer fairly reasonable prices, you know, depending on quantity and they have more options than, you know, the solid merch express thing. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause the express thing is just a bare bones, like they're moonlighting it, you know, they're not, they're pressing it after they're done doing, you know, whatever orders for the day. Yeah. Um, so I might give this uh, French label or French plant, I'm sorry, uh, a chance here pretty soon. Uh, I've been navigating the site. Like they have decent package deals. Mm-hmm. Um, I got a Brighter Death Now record that I'm going to be working on here fairly soon. Um, cool. A vinyl issue of the No Decency tape that we did cool. a few years back. Yeah. Um, you know, and then a few other things, uh, we're going to do an agonal laceration LP reissue nice. of the cassette that we had at the festival. Nice. Uh, cause I've been getting so many emails like, oh, you know, I missed yeah. this, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And there's no digital on it. So yeah. we're going to do a short run of that. Um, but yeah, I'm like looking at a list of upcoming releases and it is bonkers. Bonkers. Exactly. <laughs> That's pretty much the only way to describe it is bonkers and, you know, some of it is, you know, old guard heavy hitters and some of it is newer stuff. Cool. You know, of unknowns. Um but you know, like I said, I'm not even really working on getting any of that stuff released until after the new year. Yeah. Um, just because like trying to get anything done during the holiday season, like plants close for weeks on end, et cetera. So. Yeah. No, it's, I think it's time for everyone to chill, chill for a month. Yeah. yeah. Um, I Forgive me if this is a morbid thing to think of or bring up, but have you ever thought about the association or the synchronicity between what happened to you and what what happened to the founder of Cloyster? You know, I've never really thought about that. Um, You know, there was a point back when I was 
pretty much like at the end of my drinking and using days where I definitely almost died from full blown DTs. I was in hallucinating visual and auditorial hallucinations for three days and my heart almost exploded and all this shit. So I went through all the motions of that, having to go through detox and you know, eventually putting myself into rehab. Like it was either, it was either quit or death, one of the two, you know, and, but back then, you know, I was slowly intentionally trying to kill myself. Um, but I was too much of a fucking baby to actually put a noose around my neck or put a gun in my mouth. Um, and then when it actually came time to die, because I was, uh, I didn't want to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe I should stop all this shit because yeah. there's only going to be one outcome. Um, you know, so that was beforehand, but I don't know. I've never really thought about that, that connection. Like, you know, what if it does, you know, it's like two guys from Cloyster died and, yeah, I don't know. I've never really thought about that. Um, I mean, I don't know. It's just, it, I mean, his story is already so rare and shocking, and and then what happened to you is so rare and shocking. I mean, maybe we're I cursed. Know. It could be a curse. <laughs> well, you beat the curse. That's the thing, man. You beat the curse. Uh, kind of, maybe. Well, I think Nicole beat the curse because if she wouldn't, if she hadn't have been there, no. that would have been the end of that. Damn. So. So you keep very busy with Cloister. Um, you also do a lot of mail order. You're you're pretty big distro. I mean, mm -hmm. in the U.S., how does that work? I mean, do you do you get as much out of running a distro, or do you get what do you get out of running a distro versus running? Um, at first, I was extremely enthusiastic about it. You know, like I've always wanted to open my own record store, mm -hmm. but I fucking hate record stores mm -hmm. um, because I like I would be the type of I wouldn't make it I wouldn't have any customers at a record store because I don't want to carry fucking Beatles records and all yeah. this fucking garbage like just I don't want to have to deal with any of that so the only way to actually run something that I would like would be online and in the beginning, I was extremely enthusiastic about it. And I was, you know, buying stuff from all different labels, you know, that I, you know, respected, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then over the years, um, it's become, I don't want to say it's become a burden because it's definitely not a burden, but it's like I've really been slowing down the the distro uh, and trying to focus more on importing things as opposed to buying a bunch of American stuff because right. it's like, you know, I could buy, you know, a bunch of stuff from Tronics and I used to, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? But it's still, you know, there's 10 other shops that are carrying the same thing. And right. And, and with media mail, it doesn't really make a big difference from someone from the East coast or from Tronics exactly. or from you. Exactly. You know what I mean? So I'm trying to like hone it down, you know, with this last sale that I did, you know, for the pre black Friday or whatever, half off mm -hmm. sale. Like I do these sales to clear shit out that I've been sitting on for a yeah. long time. And, yeah. and it works, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, it, it definitely does help, but Basically, if moving forward, starting you know next year, I'm going yeah. to be extremely selective with what I carry, just yeah. because you know buying all of this stuff for the distro takes away from releases, right? And I really um, need to get out of that mindset that like, oh, I love this album, so I'm going to buy ten of them. And right. then I sell three of them. You know right. what I mean? So I'm going to be scaling it back in that sense. 
and really just kind of focusing more on releases and gigs, you know, yeah. and that could be a good or a bad thing, you know, with releasing things of unknowns, et cetera, what have you. But at the end of the day, it's like the releases are more important than the distro. For and sure. For, for a while there, the distro was more important than the label. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. But I was also buying a lot of stuff from a lot of labels. Like there was a, there was a time where I had like 500 plus diff, like a full fucking record store basically downstairs yeah. of just brand new distro stuff. And I yeah. was just like, this is too much. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but one thing that I am going to start doing too, again, is, um, I'm going to start putting more of my personal stuff on the Cloister Big Cartel site. That's of cool. Just things that I need to get rid of, yeah. you know, and that will definitely, I'll channel that money back into releases. So maybe I can get on that quarterly schedule that I'm trying to get on. Um, yeah. But like, it's just, I, I find it that, you know, it, it it can get fairly easy to get lost in running such a large distro. For sure. Um, that, yeah, I just, I don't want to say I'm sick of doing it because I'm not. I will always have like some sort of distro, but it just mm -hmm. can't be as big as it has been. Right. I know what you mean. So. For sure. Um, do you feel appreciated by your customers? Like they know what goes into what you do? Like they, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't have, I don't really get a lot of emails saying like, Hey, you know, this thing showed up fucked up or, you know, whatever. Like I try to pack things as I would like them to come to myself, mm -hmm. like as if I would be shipping something to myself. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't really have much negative feedback and I'm pretty good. Like, you know, if I send a CD out to somebody and it gets fucking, they shouldn't be a picture of it. And it's just like the CDs broken and all of the shit, like I'm going to send them another copy yeah, or I'll give them a refund. You know what right, I mean? Right, I'm not right. one of these guys that it's just like, you know, Sorry, you're shit out of luck. Yeah, you know, but it also very it it does depend too because it's like if a record shows up with a corner ding, yeah, that's part of life. It's gonna right. happen. Like, yeah, you know, I personally am not like a huge condition nerd in that right. sense, unless it shows up like totally fucked up right. or unlistenable. Like, I sent a package to one of my buddies in Germany, and he sent me pictures back. He was like, well, this box went swimming, and he showed me the, he was like, you know, the tapes and the CDs were fine, but the records were just totally drenched in water, just totally fucked up. You know what I mean? And so it's Dude, like, stuff happens I'm, like that, yeah. I'm going to replace that. No yeah. questions like that is like really shitty on whoever was handling that and we all know that trying to you know run a claim through USPS or DHL or UPS or whoever it's fucking pointless it's a waste of time it's a waste of time and usually 9 times out of 10 they're going to just not help out in anybody's favor right you know I had a big, big order from Glock Thoro, not this past batch that they did, but the previous one, where I restocked all of the CDs, and whoever was in charge of delivering that stuff completely just fucked that entire box up. There was smashed and broken discs, there was missing discs, like, there was, like, 25 CDs missing. Oh, um, you know, so I reached out to, to Glock Thor and I was just like, hey, you know, normally I wouldn't be, like, upset about something like this, but, like, this is really bad. And I 
<clears throat> sent them photos, and they're like, yeah, this is not cool, this sucks. And we were actually able to get DHL to fix the issue, which was the first time that's ever happened and will probably yeah. be the only time it'll happen. <laughs> so, Yeah, there's a lot like, of stuff you just got to charge to the game. It's just like, fuck. Yeah, but shit happens, you know yeah. what I mean? Especially yeah. with international orders, like, shit yeah. happens. Yeah. Um, but going back to, like, you know, customer satisfaction, I, I, I don't, like, have, like, Google reviews or any of any shit like that. And if I do, I don't know that they exist because <laughs> I'm not looking for them. Um, but, you know, I, I have a huge, not huge, but I have a very, very good returning customer base. Cool. You know, yeah. and and that's really cool because it's yeah. like these guys are, this is who I do it for. It's the people that just like, they, they, they're constantly ordering. They know that they can get something from me. They know that I'm going to pack it as well as I can, you know, so it's just like, that's pretty awesome and reassuring on my end to know that it's like, you know, these people are constantly happy with whatever it is they're getting, you know? Yeah, exactly. That's what it's all about. That's what makes it fun. I mean, that's what makes it worth it because running a distro is a lot of, I mean, running a distro is a lot of busy work. It's a lot of work that isn't, you know, creative work. It's not, working on your own music it's not working on your own label Mm -hmm. it's like but if you love the records first of all you're getting in yeah and you love getting them out to people and having people be stoked on them then that's really fun yeah and 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 at the end of the day it's just like you know i'm just dealing with me on the other end as a collector like i'm like a child when i open up packages and i'm just like ah fine you know what i mean yeah it's I, I, I get a big satisfaction and um you know, when I get like a big either like personal old sale, you know, there's this this guy that I've been dealing with for the past couple of months now who's basically been like piecing out his rarities to me and like super reasonable prices, excellent condition and it's like it's awesome, you know what I mean? And then with new stuff you know, I, I know that, and I do a lot of blind buying too. I buy a lot of stuff that I don't know what it is just to check it out, you know, and sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's mediocre. Sometimes it sucks, you know, but it's like, but that's just my opinion on it. You know, I could, you know, listen to a tape and then put it in the distro or discogs for five bucks and somebody will be way stoked on it. Yeah. And so it all kind of, goes full circle in that aspect of it. Totally. Um, in, you know, you mentioned Tesco and CMI as your favorite labels and kind of going back and digging deeper into the, the past with labels. Does, does checking out or, or digging into older labels like that give you any continuing new ideas or appreciation or or inspiration on how you run your label i mean yeah in a sense for sure you know it's like those two labels in particular are like very very diverse with what they're releasing like i could just use you know one of tesco's examples is a pop toast like that project has been a mainstay on that label for years. And I know that in the United States, they're not that popular. Like I can just tell because I'll get stuff for the distro and I'll sit on it, which is fine because it's like the people that do want it, want it, you know? Um, and then, you know, with cold meat industry, like starting out with, you know, like death industrial and like, uh, you know, early neo folk stuff, just kind of like all over the place, 
like power electronics and then getting into more like dark ambient, you know, like martial, just kind of like all over the place. Like mm-hmm. that's what I love about mm-hmm. that label is like every album stands out on its own, whether yeah. it be, you know, a Brighter Death Now record or an Atrium Carceri album, like all over the place. And like, you know, there's weird shit like Storm Fagel and like all of this, like, you know, Pestilence, like borderline Renaissance festival music. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I'm a fucking nerd, so I love that shit. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Yeah, and I don't know. It's just kind of like I like it when I can be blindsided by a release. Yeah. You know, like right now, you know, this African Imperial Wizard project that Tesco has been putting out, this shit's in, it's fucking incredible. You know what I mean? Like, and I don't know who it is, and nobody is going to know who it is. I have some speculations, but that's all they are. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but, it, you know, it's stuff like that that does not fit. It, you know yeah. what I mean? It's not a power electronics record. It's not, you know, like it, it, it's not you know, abrasive and in your face. It's like structured, just like it. I don't even really know how to describe it other than fucking awesome. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and like, that's why I continue to follow these guys because they they do they do what i like to do they're just like okay so yeah here's a reissue of this album that's four hundred dollars online so you could buy it for 30 bucks and then here's this new project that nobody knows who the fuck it is and it ends up being like one of my most listened thing in previous years yeah you know what i mean um and then with Cold Meat Industry, with Roger, you know, resurrecting it, I don't know what his future is planning on to being with that, but I don't think that he will be, like, releasing other bands' stuff. I think he's going to be focusing on reissuing his back catalog that is basically, like, hard as fuck to find, yeah. you know, Um which all of that stuff needs proper remixed, remastered, you know, package overhaul, like that stuff is necessary. And I'm very excited for it. Like I have all of the original stuff, but like the copy of temptations that I sound sounds like it was submerged in water for a couple of years. And then it's just, it sounds like dog shit. So like, I really look for that reissue. Yeah. Um, but yeah, sorry for trailing off. (laughs) No, that's great. You were at the, you were at the cold meat industries, uh, show was it a a, was it an anniversary show was a what was the definition of that so this one that they had just did was the 35th anniversary right um and it's it's curated by the production company death disco i mean i'm Mm -hmm. sure roger obviously has some say in it but i think he just kind of like shows up and plays but this last one was really cool because it was at a theater that was completely seated you Mm. know what i mean and there was no like reserved seatings so you know we were sitting in a different spot of the theater for each act that we watched there was like two balconies um so we got to watch like you know the final deutsch nepal live set ever from you know a hundred feet up just looking right down on the stage and that was pretty pretty awesome um you know i'm a big morton fan so like he opened and it was just like it kind of like set the tone for the for what the weekend was going to be it was Mm -hmm. just like dirgy and gross and it was awesome like i said that it was seated because most of the people at that show 
are over their 40s, you know, yeah. we all have bad backs and bad <laughs> knees and all this shit, so it was pretty cool, you know, that yeah. we were all able to kind of, like, sit down. Um, <laughs> nice. One of my highlights was Sephiroth, but I'm just, I'm a nerd for Ulf stuff, like, even his solo material is, like, some of my favorite shit that's come yeah. out within the past, you know, 20 years or so. Um, so it was really cool to see him. And I think we were maybe like third or fourth row back. Like we made sure to get a good seat for that set and it was just awesome. But like everybody did a killer job, you know, Brighter Death Now was awesome in the sense that, uh, you know, it was still Roger and Lena, but uh, Christian Olsen joined them. Oh, cool. and helped out with electronics and it was just like with him doing that and the visuals that they had created for the backdrop and it was just like it was one of the best brighter death now shows i've seen except for the mm-hmm. one that i saw in denton back in i think it was like 14 that was a goddamn nightmare but i <laughs> loved every second of it <laughs> Yeah, you know, each 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 BDN shows a gamble, you know. But yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but it's still like it's still a great time because just you know going into it that it's just going to be total debauchery. Yeah, you know, and it's like, yeah. So, but you know, we were <clears throat> excuse me, we were very stoked to see MZ. 412, but some shithead fucking opened a fire escape door like 10, 15, 10 minutes into their set or something. Oh. And you can hear the alarm going off, but their their performance was so loud that it felt like it fit in with what they were doing, but I was yeah. like, no, this is not right. Like, yeah what the fuck is this? And then sure enough, the lights come on and they have to get everybody out of the building. And since the fire department came, they had to shut the whole thing down. So we got about, we got an intro from Inset, uh, which was kind of a bummer. Yeah. I mean, I've seen them before and they're like incredible live, but there was people there that had never got to see them before that were like, that was one of the main acts that pe- they came yeah. out, you know, so that was, you know, super shitty. And people thought that they would have been able to just get added on to the next day. But, you know, it's three guys in that project and two of them had prior engagements the following uh-huh. day. So they couldn't get re-added on. So we all just kind of missed it. That sucks. Was it some sort of intentional sabotage, do you think? No, I think it was just some idiot that went out a wrong door okay you know not knowing whatever um that was all we got from it we don't know if it was an employee or if it was just Mm -hmm. some patron that you know like oh that says exit i'm gonna go outside Mm -hmm. and then it ended up being a fire door that triggered an alarm and so yeah that's annoying that's bummer yeah well, cool that you still made it, though. I mean, that's that's cool that you travel for shows like that and that you really throw down and, you know, go to those important events yeah. and do them yourself. I mean, that Dominion of Flesh that you did in Sweden sounded very epic. Yeah, that show was fucking awesome. And the one you've got coming up sounds insane. I'm really excited to hear about what that's all about. So... Um, I don't know if you know this, but I like to ask everyone I interview, and sometimes I catch them off guard and sometimes they're prepared, what their top five releases of all time are. Oh, shit. So I like to have it off the top. So I get the sense that you weren't ready for that one. So I like that it's off the top and that you haven't prepared a list. So what would you tell me? All time... Um, when I, my introduction to heavy music or extreme music, you know, I had my older brother, he's seven years older than me. 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, back in the late 80s and early 90s, you know, when he was in high school in the early 90s, he was, you know, starting to discover things and take things in on his own. And I remember when I was about 10 years old, he played me Spine of God by Monster Magnet, mm-hmm. which was their first, like, proper full-length record. And I had no idea what Psych or Doom or whatever, but this shit was just like, it fucking hit me. And it was this this drug-fueled, psychedelic, stoner, whatever. And I know that those dudes, like, turned into a fucking laughing stock probably, like, eight or nine years later. Which it was, it was fucking, they they got really fucking terrible. But, you know, getting into an album like that at that age was kind of a pivotal, pivotal point for me because a couple of years after that, my family moved away from, like, I, we, I was born in Illinois mm-hmm. and... We moved away, but my brother stayed in Illinois, so I didn't really have him to show me, like, new stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I ended up getting into a lot of punk and crust and just all sorts of shit. But, I mean, Spine of God by Monster Magnet was just one of those records that I always kept revisiting. Mm -hmm. time and time and time again like i have a copy of it on tape up there i got an original glitter house pressing sitting back over here cool um but i don't i mean it, it it's really hard because i have like such favorites from all different spectrums yeah um I just recently acquired one of my Holy Grails for insanely cheap, but Room 39 by Rune's Order, like, that that album is just like, I don't know, it's it's flawless from start to finish, you know, it's like ambient, kraut, like, just... It's bonkers, but it's, like, super psychedelic. And, like, it's weird because, like, when I was using drugs, I was listening to not real drug music, I guess you could say, you know? And then as I, after I got sober and starting to get more into, like, this, like, underground psyche spacey industrial type stuff i just kind of like have really stuck to that um you know so i've been listening to a digital version of that album for fucking 10 12 years now i finally got both versions the first and the second edition for super super cheap lately um you know, uh, Truth Will Make You Free by Genocide Oregon is definitely one of those mm-hmm. records that it's just like start to finish is a total mind fuck. Like, I think that that record is what really made me like go back and listen to their previous works and then stay current mm-hmm. on all of their modern stuff. Yeah. Um, fuck. Dr. Dre's The Chronic <laughs> is a huge, huge one for me when I was younger. And Outcast, like, I, like, like I said, I'm all over the place. Like, Outcast is one of my favorite bands of all time. Yeah. Like, they're not. Which Outcast? What's that? Which Outcast is your is your favorite? Because they're they're very different, all of them. Oh, dude, like. It it like I started with Southern Playalistic when it came out because of my brother, you know. Yeah. Um. So like that one will always be like the most sentimental to me, but like, 
you know, some of my favorite songs are on Atlians and Aquemini yeah. and Stankonia, but yeah. like as a whole, you know, when they when they came out with Speaker Box Love Below, that shit was on my turntable all day, every day. I was like twenty when that record came yeah. out. Like I blew through three copies on vinyl. Well, on, of that record because I just listened to it so fucking much and like it's wow. still one of my favorites. Cool. Um, but yeah, I don't know, dude. Like those guys are fucking geniuses. Like, Absolutely. Yeah, I love them so much. Uh, one more, maybe like industrial related. Fuck. Probably the whole Great Death one through three from Brighter Death Now. Cool. Um, it's just, it makes me feel gross when I listen to it. Like, it just kind of like brings me back to this point in my life where everything was just bad. And mm. I like to to remember that, you know, I've been like in the, the shit, you know yeah. what I mean? Uh, yeah. and, like I like listening to music that makes me remember who I am. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If that makes any sort of sense, it's, it is kind of morbid, but like, you know, I, I, I don't like to, uh, forget, parts of my life that have kind of defined me as a person after the fact, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Uh, yeah. What about five releases or projects, bands, mm -hmm. you know, loosely interpreted of the past year or two that you really are excited about? Um, newer, not reissues, you know, new things. Newer, newer, newer stuff. Or you know, or new releases by older artists. I know, like yeah. and you can you can count your own. I mean, no, no one really does that. But I think counting your own label is fair game. I People mean, are too usually humble to do that, but I think that's fair game. That new, that new control record, both of them actually. The one that torment that came out on Cloister and Great Divide that came out on Malignant, pretty much yeah. at the same exact time. Yeah. Both of those records are fucking phenomenal, but they're different yep. in their own right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, the Flugarnas Ferrar from Alphamania and Project Hot, like, yep. I find myself listening to that collaboration tape more than anything else. Like, the, it's just like, it's disgusting. Yep. And I love it. Yeah. Um, what else? I mean, it, 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 it's the subterranean rights that Grant did. Like, I've been a Nod fan for a long time. And when he sent me the tracks for that record, I was just blown the fuck away like yeah. there's nothing that he had ever done but had done before and the the fact it's like with the, his recording process with actually going down into these fucking sewers and like you know risking getting sick just to yeah. kind of come up with this masterpiece basically yeah. you know yeah. is a really, really, really big fan of that record. Um, I'm like looking around at my stuff, trying to <laughs> pick one, but I really can't. You know, the A Tracks Morg reissue cassette box that Hiroshima mm -hmm. just did is really fucking cool. Like that project, you know, his his legacy is just like it, it's unmatched yeah. you know what i mean and the fact that all of those titles that came in that 12 cassette box are just like either you're not going to find them and if you do find them 
they're going to be way ridiculously overpriced. Like, yep. And I have a lot of those originals that I've accumulated over the years, but to have everything like in one set box for a reasonable price retail, you know what I mean? And you get like hours and hours and hours of just like pure fucking filth yeah. for the price of what one of those original tapes would cost. You know for what sure. I mean? So I remember when I got that, I listened to that straight through for the first I mean, four days that I had it, I think I blasted through like 10 of the 12. Yeah. And then, you know, so like, I really love that project, but I would have to say that my favorite album within the past five years would have to be Kane Sculpt by Trepenering Richard Allen. Like that record start to finish is just fucking mind blowing. It's like, you know, I was talking with Thomas when it was released or before it was released. Cause you know, he was sending me the demos and mm-hmm. different mixes and all that kind of stuff. And I was just like, dude, this sounds like a blues record. And he was like, you're the only one that's actually picked up on that. <laughs> so, like, going in to listening to this, like, extremely bombastic death industrial record, but it has this just, like, insane percussive energy to it, and it's just, like, every track is just a fucking banger from start to finish, and, like, I find myself listening to that record multiple times a year since yeah. it came out out of yeah. like you know, like I have it on I I think I have it on seven different versions <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> like a CD version and then I got like three or four different tape versions of it and I yeah. got all the original and reissues of the the, the vinyl edition of it like yeah. But I'm biased, like, you know, that dude has been a pivotal part of Cloyster in the beginning, you know, and he helped me out a lot with his label, Bilatin. Mm -hmm. You know, he was like, hey, I can't really do this one right now. Do you want to meet these guys and go from there? And that basically, like, he's the one that's responsible for my Swedish connection. Um, Cool. And, like, I'm eternally grateful for that dude. But, yeah, like, out of all of his work, that's the main one that I find myself listening to on a fairly regular basis. But I also listen to all of his stuff. Like, one of his previous projects, Dead Letters Spell Out Dead Words, like, that shit is just totally like sad and depressing but it's like you know it's it's more on the droney side of things you Mm -hmm. know it's like dead letters was his like sad project and then he morphed into tree pan and it just turned into this just like total like self-loathing hateful like pissed but still dirgy yeah. death industrial type stuff and then it's just formed into what it is now which is just incredible awesome so uh, interesting that you said about the the, the swedish connection because i was actually going to ask you like how are you so deep in with so many like swedes and like old school new school the whole thing like you really tapped in I, th- I think that was kind of just a fluke that it kind of like these guys saw that I started putting out stuff from certain Swedes and then I would get people hitting me up like, hey, do you want to do this? Or, well, it's just weird. It's like every one of those relationships have just kind of formed organically. Um, I did. uh I did solicit uh, Peter Newstrom from Megaptera, you know, about, you know, doing 
maybe some old reissues by him. And he was like, oh, I don't want to reissue the old stuff. But do you want to do a new record? And I was just like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, just like, I don't, it all kind of just formed. It was weird. It all kind of like, it, it didn't all happen at once, but like, I love the Swedish sound, like from different regions, like each yeah. region has its own sound. So you like, you get the guys from up North and you're getting like this, like dirgy death industrial. And then you get even further North up to, Sinsval and shit like that, and you get the nasty post mortem electronics, which I really, really, really love that that shit. Um, and I I think a lot of it too is a result of just tra- traveling out there. Mm-hmm. I I love it out there. Like I would like to move there. Yeah. Um, but you know, fi- financially, on paper. I don't think I would be beneficial for Swedish society, but who knows? Like it's, it's, it, it'll be a long process that Nicole and I have actually been strongly considering, like we would like to move there eventually. Mm -hmm. Um, Just because it is like such a welcoming, like everybody that we know out there is so friendly and so accommodating and then meeting Mm -hmm. strangers every time that we go out there that are, you know, best friends now. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, I don't know. It, 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 it's rewarding to like go on a vacation and put on a gig somewhere that we're totally unfamiliar with. And then having people come up and just being like, very appreciative that you know you're fucking insane and stupid for coming out here and doing this but we love it yeah you know what i mean and i don't know it's just yeah it's yeah cool well before we sign off um what else would you like to add in or tell me about what's coming up in the near future with, with Cloyster or anything that you want to mention that I didn't ask about you think is important to say? Uh, I, I think that we've touched on enough. I can give you a, a little teaser of some things that I'll be working on. Yeah. That I have written out for my own reminders. <laughs> um, but uh, got a new Moral Order record coming out soon, cool. and it's all new material. Um, it was supposed to be submitted earlier this year, but you know, hiccups, life, blah, blah, blah. But that's going to be part of the next new following batch as well as the Argyop and manifesto, um, projects that I discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a new Sophia EP that just came out on Ant Zen Raubau that I'll be doing a cassette version of. Cool. Um, a new sub clinic, and then there we're supposed to be doing a sub clinic Himmelkult split cassette, but we're mm. waiting on a track for that. So that should definitely happen in the future. Uh, a new DSM three cassette, uh, the new Svenska Lick Brennings for an Indigen set, which I know that I butchered the fuck out of that name. <laughs> But basically, that translates to the Swedish Crematory Society. Yeah. And it's just nasty. It, it's gross, and I love it. Um, cool. And then we got uh, a new Slow Slow Loris, who is a German act. They've yeah. done a couple couple tapes with me, and then, you know, Michael from Zetrum put out their last one, which was fucking awesome. And it it was funny because, like, I was totally familiar, unfamiliar <clears throat> with Slow Slow Loris <clears throat> until they got added to a gig here that I went to, and I watched them play, and as soon as they were done, I was like, oh, my God, can I release something by you guys? Yeah, yeah. And they're yeah. like, what? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and we've developed a great relationship with them as artists and as people. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so, like, I will always put their stuff out if they ask me to. But when they told me that they were doing a release on Zatrom, I was, like, so fucking stoked for them because it yeah. was the same scenario. They played a show, and Michael was there, and he was so blown away by their performance that he's like, hey. <laughs> so yeah. I love when stuff like that happens. Like, I don't yeah, like... Really great. I don't like like hogging my artists. I, like, yeah. I want them to evolve and you know take what's offered. You know what sure, I mean? Like, sure. I'm I'm all for that kind of stuff. Uh, and then you know I a BDN record and a new tree pad record. I just got a lot of shit wow. that's in the pipeline. Yeah. Um, that we're gonna get working on. We're gonna hit the ground running in 2023. So cool. great. Well, that's a lot to look forward to. And, um, I appreciate all that you do. And I would just say, make sure you also take care of yourself. I mean, yeah, that. yeah, the health is good. It's, you know, I got this thing in me that if my heart <laughs> decides to stop again, it will fucking zap me. Okay. It's went off once and it was, uh, an adventure to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> But, but yeah, man, thank, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it was a pleasure. And uh, again, I appreciate it. And enjoy the rest of your day off if it, if it is a real day off. And yeah, I got to pack orders after this. Well, that's 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 a day off in the life of uh, <laughs> someone like us, right? Okay, we'll take care. All right, man. Bye bye. Thanks, Oscar. Thanks for tuning in to White Sandy Noise Podcast, and a big thank you to all Patreon supporters that make this show possible. If you're a fan of the podcast but not currently supporting, head over to patreon.com slash white centipede noise now to check out the many benefits of doing so and find a level that fits you.